Along the narrow strip of land where the forests meet the waters of the Great Lakes lives a unique assemblage of plants and animals. And none is more unique or more critically endangered than a small bird called the piping plover. The piping plover and other threatened and endangered species, like the pitcher's thistle and Lake Huron tansy, depend on this coastal shore ecosystem for their very survival. Instead of a traditional nest, piping plovers lay their eggs in a simple depression among the sand and cobblestones. They spend their entire summer nesting, feeding, and raising their young within view of the breaking waves. But piping plovers and pitcher's thistles are not the only things attracted to these beaches. Piping plovers from the Great Lakes spend the winter along the coast from Georgia to Texas. Each spring as the plovers migrate north, conservationists gather to prepare for their arrival. So the goal is to keep the pair on their set of eggs that they laid to begin with. The plovers arrive in late April, long before the summer beach users. Biologists take to the field to locate plovers that are choosing mates and getting ready to nest. They were just over that ridge the other day. And that's where they were yesterday, too, so they might not have settled down yet. Gotta go find them. Have to go find them. Is that a plover flying? Yes. Where? At the lagoon, back there. Oh, yep, there he is. Edge of the water. Big bow tie. Looks yeah. like it might be a male. Yeah. So we catch them as chicks when they're a couple days old and, and ban them. And then when they return as adults, we know that they, they hatch, um, in, at least in the Great Lakes. And then we can identify them as an individual, kind of their social security number for life. So our male is light green over metal, which means he's from Platte River in Sleeping Bear. And then our female is light blue over metal, which means that she's from North Manitou Island. The Great Lakes uh, population of piping plover is one of three piping plover populations. There's an Atlantic Coast population and a Great Plains population. Those two populations are much larger, so the Great Lakes population is by far the smallest and the most critically endangered. Historically, piping plovers nested throughout the Great Lakes. Today, however, they nest in only a few areas. Uh, the piping plover population in the Great Lakes has, uh, has increased uh, a bit in the last uh, six or seven years. We, uh, we had uh, 16 pairs uh, about seven years ago, and, uh, and, and last year we had 32 pairs. Uh, that's a, a nice increase, but that's still a critically low number. Although most people have not seen a piping plover in the wild, many are familiar with the plover's distant cousin the killdeer. Common from backyards to beaches across Michigan, the killdeer can be distinguished from the piping plover by its larger size and the two black bands across the chest. The piping plover has some, uh, some problems here in Michigan. Uh, one of the biggest problems it probably has is, is humans. Uh, Michigan, uh, the Great Lakes shoreline are very popular, not only for development of, of houses, those types of uh, subdivisions, those kinds of things, but also the recreational uh, activities that take place on, on the beaches, just from everything from swimming to walking to walking, uh, walking your pets, those types of things. And the piping plover is a very, very sensitive bird, and it will abandon its nest or abandon young very easily if it's disturbed too much in the Great Lakes. This is a really hard pack. A recent visit by biologists indicated that a pair of plovers may be ready to nest on this beach. And they act territorial, and if it looks like they want that area, then we'll start putting signs up so that they'll hopefully they'll stay in that area. So we put up the signs to close the beach to human traffic, to people that are coming to the beach to visit where birds are nesting. And this is called a psychological fencing, and we put it out large enough so that if people walk up, like, say, to read the signs, they won't disturb the bird off the nest. The, the bird, the plover, will feel safe sitting on the nest. Otherwise, they may, if there's too much disturbance, they may decide, we don't like this spot, we're going to go, so the, the plovers will go someplace else, which could be a place that we don't know, so we can't monitor them that way. 
So this just gives them a safe, hopefully a safe and quiet place to nest. After putting up the rope fencing, their hunch was confirmed. Do you see him? Oh yeah, I see him right up there, up by that uh, that stick there. Oh, so, the sort of burned one there? Well, no, in front of there. There's a smaller stick. Okay. Okay. Is he yep. right there? Is he sitting? He is. He was sitting. sitting, yes. Okay. They locate the nest, then return with a small temporary exclosure used to protect the nest. And when they see footprints in the sand, discover the male of this pair was a bird they recognize. I wonder what it looked like. That's what it looks like. Hey, one, foot stomp, foot stomp. <laughs> Hopalong, as he is affectionately known, was injured somehow and lost his foot six years ago. However, he has successfully nested near this same spot every year since. That's <laughs> why they're so hard to find. That went pretty easy. Maybe get rid of some of our tracks. I lost him when I was sitting up the top. The biologists will return soon to put up a larger, more durable exclosure. These exclosures not only help protect piping plovers from people, vehicles, and dogs, but also from wild predators. Predation is a very serious problem for the Great Lakes piping plover. Um, there's a wide range of predators that um, uh, prey upon the adults that are on the nest, that eat the eggs, and then in, in particular the, um, the young piping plover chicks after they hatch are very vulnerable. Uh, predators include merlins, gulls, crows, coyotes, fox, raccoons, uh, dogs and cats. Predation is a, is a natural factor for any wild species, but for the Great Lakes piping plover, with only 32 pairs, every uh, loss to, to any factor, and even predation, which is a, uh, a, a natural phenomenon, is an acute loss that we, we can't uh, tolerate a great deal of with that few uh, of, of plovers. Hopalong's mate was banded three years ago at Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore, 80 miles away. She laid a total of four eggs. The parents take turns sitting on the nest. About a month after the last egg is laid, the chicks hatch. Within minutes, the young stumble to their feet and follow the parents. The chicks start feeding and gain strength quickly. For the next month, the family will not wander too far from the nest site. The parents will protect the young the best they can from potential predators like this gull. In situations where the parents are killed or nests are abandoned, biologists rescue the eggs and raise the young plovers in captivity. Captive rearing is not a solution. Uh, you still need habitat protection and protection from predators. You can't just uh, rear these birds in a facility and expect uh, the whole population to recover. This is a last resort technique to try to help the population out. Once the chicks um, are able to fly and able to bathe by themselves, um, we look at what sites uh, still have uh, young plovers and adult plovers there, and we try to release them with other youngsters and adults um, in order to give them a, um, let them kind of bond with other plovers and, and make the migration south together. And it was only two years ago that we 
found that um, this actually did work and that we have birds that return and breed in the wild again. So that, that's been very exciting for us to have birds that we've actually reared uh, return and breed in the wild with other plovers. The fate of the Great Lakes Piping Plover depends not only on the efforts of wildlife biologists, but ultimately on the people who live near and use the beaches the plovers call home. I usually come with my binoculars and sit up here on the dune so I can uh, get an overview of the closed off area and watch um, for the chicks and keep count of them, watch where they're going, uh, watch for people on the beach, um, unleashed dogs and people coming into the enclosed area. A lot of it's the education, they just don't realize and so if you can uh, take the time to talk to them and, they'll, and explain that you know what the situation is and um, how rare this bird is and we're almost blessed to have it land here and nest and reproduce and it's a very special area. That's the other thing about having a lot of people here is you know asking them not to leave any food, pick up everything because that really brings the gulls and the crows. They're, they're looking for food and scraps and so that brings them in even more and so on their way they can just pick up a baby plover too. <laughs> There is a piping plover uh, right down in that uh, fenced-in area, and that has been an annual event here now for uh, the last, uh, oh, six years probably, six or seven years. I feel very, very, very honored to, and very fortunate to be able to observe it on such a personal level. I went into business because that's where I wanted to be, and, and I love business. I sail a large sailboat. Uh, I race a sailboat, uh, like the Mackinac's and stuff like that. I, I do a motorboat and, uh, for fishing and whatnot uh, on the Great Lakes as well. All of this seems, in my mind, is very, very compatible, whether it's sailing or it's motorboating or it's beach. All of this, if you're sensitive to each and every one of these issues, they're, they're extremely compatible if we're thoughtful about it. By July, Hopalong and his mate had successfully raised their four young to the point where they could fly and by September, all of the plovers had departed for their winter home. Conservationists will now hold their breath, hoping the plover's journey to the south and back goes safely. I think one of the key elements in protecting piping plovers uh, in Michigan is just having people understand that they share these beaches, share the shorelines with this very special species, the piping plover. Well, most people are very interested in protecting a rare species and with some slight modifications to their behavior, uh, we think that uh, humans can continue to use the beach and that we can preserve our species at the same time. Well, I feel rather honored to be a witness to this endangered bird and to be part of um, helping them carry on because it is a rare thing. Yeah, having a rare bird right here, right here in front of our house is, uh, has had a dramatic impact on my life. And I certainly want to help uh, that bird make its way, and, uh, and particularly when it's in declined to such small numbers. One of the experiences that I've, that I've had that's incredibly rewarding is just talking to people on the beach. I mean, their beach is being used by an endangered species, there aren't very many of these birds, and when they see them, when they see the chicks, when they see the nest, they get really excited about it too, and that just makes me all the more excited about what I'm doing. It's neat that in a 60-day period you can go from having no birds to having an, a pair, having a nest, having chicks and watching them grow up and fly away. That's a, a very good feeling. Chicken out! Where? Right there! Oh, no, no, no. 